everybody. Welcome back to another episode here of Cockpit Council. Today I've got with me uh, Nir Dagen. Um, Nir, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey, great uh, being here, Tim. Uh, my name is Nir Dagan. I'm the general counsel at WIZ. Um, WIZ is the fastest growing cybersecurity startup in the world and probably one of the fastest growing startups ever. So um, it's quite an interesting uh, ride so far. Um, prior to that, I was um, an associate at the corporate department of METAR, which is um, Israel's leading uh, international law firm. So pretty much all the Israeli tech scene, um, their lawyers, um, most of them are, are in METAR. So that's the firm that I was in, um, yeah. representing companies in all stages of their life cycle from incorporation um, to the M&A or IPO. Um, and have uh, decided to make the jump a year ago uh, into in-house. So I moved to Wiz, who were a client of mine, and uh, now I'm their general counsel. That's that's awesome. How do you like it so far? So far, it's great. I mean, much different than I expected um, before making the move. Of, I, I was always against move to in-house counsel and uh, being uh, um, the cocky lawyer at a big big law thought that it's the best thing uh um that god gave us um but was happened coincidentally really um um they spoke to me um over a year ago offered me to come i originally said no then um decided that if i don't make it the move now then at least i'll i need to be honest with myself that i'll stay uh in big law forever um right. just decided to make the move and i don't regret it for a second well, you so you had worked with uh, with the folks at the founders of Wiz for for a little while, right? A couple of previous like outside counsel, a couple of previous organizations, right? Yes, yes, I was with I, I worked with them um, in their first startup. I was um, um, I was an associate, um, a young lawyer at the time, a young associate. Um, it was my first M and A transaction. Microsoft acquired them. They had a startup by the name of Adalom, um, okay. and then. Then they moved to Microsoft. They were there for a few years, and once they um, came up with the idea for Wiz, um, I was actually not supposed to be the lawyer on that um, client, but I asked to because of the prior relationship, and I really liked them. Um, yeah. So I, I, my request was uh, um, answered, and that led to a continuous relationship and and me moving to Wiz. That's that's awesome. That's awesome. That's that's a great story. It's it, it's it's wonderful to see like outside counsel who are who are that willing, like that proactive about trying to build that relationship with uh, with the business, uh, with the business founders and and being a part of that team. And really, obviously, you know, they valued the work that you did and they valued you and the way that you brought business perspective to, you know, to to your practice. So that's, I mean, it's just a testament to, uh, to the solid advice. Like the firm's definitely missing you, I'm sure, at this point, right? By so, now they're over. By now, by now they already are over me. But, uh, um, <laughs> but, but yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah, I think I think I always had a good um, relationship with them. We're both uh, um, high risk adverse, um, so they always uh, um, they always had issues with the lawyers that were, you know more careful and I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing but I mean that's what it is that's how I am um, yeah so we 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 have we're on the same wavelength that's awesome so what what has been you know some of the biggest challenges that you've seen going in-house for the first time from a firm so I, I think um, the main thing um, is that when you're in the firm I mean although we like to think that you know we're, I mean, we were like very business oriented um, and we're not the typical lawyers. We were never the typical lawyers of like, oh, these are your true alternatives you choose. Um, at the end of the day, you gave a recommendation um, of some type and usually it was, you know, accepted and, and you, but, but it was your recommendation here. Um, you really need like the expectation of, from me at least uh, so far is to really call the shots um, on a lot of the cases um and then you also take the responsibility of right of calling the wrong shot um which happens right. from time to time. so um there is much more um you know responsibility on your shoulders 
Um, also, the fact that um, I'm based in Israel and most of our business is, is in the US. Um, so it's the, the whole time zone difference. It's not that I'm an Israeli lawyer in, in an Israeli firm and I could say at one point, okay, my day is finished, even, even if it's really, really late. Here, it's like I'm working um, East Coast hours in Israel. So it's, uh, yeah. um, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge, but, um, but it's an interesting one. Yeah, so what, uh, is it 6.30 there? Now it's six. Yeah, yes, yeah. It's a seven hour. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a that's a tough that's a tough swing. I mean, not not as tough as you know the ten hours would be if you're dealing with West Coast time. But yeah, um, yeah. yeah in the quarter, in the quarter we do that as well, but uh, but not on not on the day to day basis. Right. So uh, so how big is your team? Is it just you? No. Um, there's me, um, three more lawyers, um, and one legal ops function. Okay. Um, uh, one of our lawyers, um, she's the DPO, so she's in charge of all the privacy matters. Yep. Um, and we're still, uh, we're growing. Um, we're hiring a, a privacy analyst now um, to join our DPO um, with all the challenges that have to do with privacy. And like, there's a ton of projects that need to be handled and you know, no one has the capacity to because of um, all the customer transactions. Right. Um, and then we're also hiring additional um transactional lawyers to help with that we're very um we're, we're with is like as hyper growth as it can get um yeah. with i mean pretty much close to um um hundreds of customers within a year so it's a lot of transactions and a lot of them are not on on not on our paper uh, we're trying to change it now so it adds a lot of uh a lot of work um that needs to get done yeah you're on you're on a rocket ship you you and you and the team are growing like crazy that's awesome um mm-hmm. tell tell me about the approach that you took for for your first hire and i think it's also interesting to be at this stage of of an organization and you already have a legal ops hire can you talk a little bit about uh about those things yes of course um first of all i need to give a lot of uh you know respect and kudos to like also like the management team and the ceo the finance team because they're everyone tells me that growing so quickly in one year is like, it's not, it's like unheard of or it's not very common. Um, and they really see the need, um, you know, they want speed and, 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 and for us to work around the clock. So th- they understand that and um, they really are supportive of the hiring. So that's something that I thought would be more of a challenge to ask, but I mean, the team supports me um, in the company, um, awesome. the management team. Um, with respect to hires, our first, well, I knew that my my I came from a corporate corporate department, but I had a lot of transactional um, background as well. So I knew that I can handle everything that from customer agreements to all the corporate work, labor work. Because in Israel, you do a lot of in a corporate department, you do a lot of everything. So yeah, unless there's litigation, like any you know day to day labor um, related stuff, um, equity options, um, corporate transaction all that I could do but I knew that my weak spot is um, privacy um, yeah. so uh, that's when I asked Maya our DPO to join um, and she helped with the transactional but also owned the privacy stuff so that was just like my my black hole um, yeah. so that was that was the first hire um, the next two legal hires were are still also focused mainly on uh, um, transactional but on both sides so we have vendors um and right. customers um and and the legal ops was actually um an interesting um an interesting um hire we i mean I, I, in theory i wanted someone that does legal ops i knew of it i didn't know of it when i was in in-house oh when i was a, sorry in, in the law firm uh yeah. but as i started um when i went in-house and i started looking at okay well i knew there was legal tech so i tried to see what kind of legal tech exists etc um, I also learned of this function, and I was speaking to Maya about how too bad that we don't really have that function in Israel. Like it doesn't, it's a very new field area as of, as itself, and specifically yeah. in Israel, it's almost non-existent. Um, and she told me about Rosie, who was moving. She was a paralegal in the UK, and she was moving to Israel. So we okay. decided to try and 
convert her from paralegal to legal ops. And now she's um, helping us across the board on, I guess on both things, like she's reviewing agreements um, and taking care of all the systems and everything that has to do. So she's uh, she's much more than legal ops. That's her official title, but she's uh, much more than that. That's awesome. That's awesome. I mean, that's that's great. Like great foresight on your part to uh, to to prioritize that function. That's something that as we uh, as we continue to grow at Link Squares, that's that's top of mind for me. I, you know, I I have I have two attorneys on the team, um, and primarily focused on you know on doing the customer agreements and. You know, we're we're in a little bit of a different situation because the legal team at Link Squares is kind of like customer zero, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we we get to you know play product people a little bit, which is a lot of fun uh, and probably pretty frustrating for our product team sometimes. But uh, <laughs> but legal ops is kind of the next thing on the list uh, for me to to really be thinking about and how you know how and at what point do uh, it doesn't make sense for us to to dedicate a resource there. So, I mean, that's that's awesome. Like to be able to anticipate the level of growth that you that you've had and and recognize the the value in that resource is really uh, is really something something amazing. So that's that's awesome. Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, the you know there's all the legal tech and and we'll touch on link squares as well. Um, but if you think that if you like, there are self fulfilling on their own but if you really want to like maximize it then you need someone it's very helpful to have someone dedicated to take care of like you know of working the um the legal tech so um yeah. definitely recommend it to anyone listening yeah it's you know it's interesting because i, I talked i talked to a lot of people a lot of in-house attorneys about it and and that you know people who are not in the, the legal tech space they're like Tell me about the legal tech and what it can do and what it can't do, and and you know not just link squares, but all sorts of different everything from IP management to matter management, etc. And you know, it's I, I always tell people that being a lawyer is the only job that I've had where I haven't had to actually come in and learn some like some specific software. Like I did underwriting for a number of years for residential mortgages and like for a couple of different banks and going to the bank. And like you have to learn the software, and this is how you review the the applicant file, and so on and so forth. If you're in sales, you're gonna go in, you're gonna learn Salesforce. If you're a Salesforce shop, or if you're some, you know, some other some other, you know, sales enablement tool. If you're in finance, you're using NetSuite, right? If you're in if you're in uh, the people function, you got a you know a suite of software that that you, everybody has to learn these systems. And coming in as an attorney. Like, okay, maybe you learn like how to do research on Lexis and Westlaw, right? But other than that, your tech stack is like Microsoft Word and some email client. And maybe if you're really unfortunate, you get stuck using Microsoft Excel as a lawyer. Right. <laughs> um, and so like like there there is this aspect of, of okay, like it's technology, like Salesforce doesn't, sell for you. Salesforce doesn't organize your entire sales team for you without some level of work, some level of management, some level of upkeep, right? And I think that from a legal tech perspective, that's that's like for it to be successful for you, you do have to dedicate some time to it and being able to utilize the um, the legal operations function to to help you know, to help leverage that technology for the for the team is is absolutely the right way to go. Yeah, that, that reminds me. By the way, I remember when I when I joined and I told our CEO that um, I'm looking into like getting tech. So he looks at me and he's like, "Word." Um, <laughs> and then, and then and then I started explaining to him that today there's a software and it's not just the Word in in Adobe. Um, right. It's just not, not only the Office 365. So, uh, so yeah, that definitely resonates. Um, I think one of the challenges with legal tech is that we're still looking for the sales force of legal tech, uh, which will uh, uh, hopefully be link squares. But it just yeah. because you have people coming in and even if someone has experience with legal tech, it might not be the experience with the tool that you're using. While right. sales, anyone who came from sales, 
pretty much knows Salesforce um, right. or NetSuite for finance. So, so that's still of a, of, of a challenge and up for grabs. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's definitely the way that, the way that we're looking at it. And, and two, like, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know about your, you know, in your current role, but how much of your time is, is really spent doing contracts? Like I think about when I was at DraftKings, like by the time that I left DraftKings, like there was a very small number of people on that entire team, uh, that entire legal team at DraftKings that actually dealt with contracts on a day in and day out basis. The like 75% of the people on the team had nothing to do with contracts. And so like we've got this like CLM and contract based legal tech, but there's a lot more that needs to be done, I think, for the for the legal function. But I'd be interested in hearing from you what um you know what uh, sort of what your split is like. Right. So so our, our split is currently it's very heavy on the contract side. Okay. Um well, I mean, reason being is one, we're experiencing the hyper growth um, yeah. and, you know, a huge ac customer acquisition, which in, the, in itself makes, you know, even people using your paper and, and, and we are a cybersecurity company and we um, we scan our, our customers' cloud environments. Um, so usually, you know, they all have their worry, even if it's nuances about privacy and data and what exactly we see and we don't see. So even the ones that um, today we have more and more customers signing as is um, usually small, like mid or mid price, smaller customers, but you still get quite a few um, comments or questions. Um, and then we're also very he heavy enterprise focused. So, you know, the, um, I forgot what the percentage now of fortune 500 companies that are our customers, I think it's like 30% or maybe more. It's awesome. Um, so, so it's amazing in the company, you know, it, it's a testament to the need of the product and the company's growth. But when you work with the big uh, regulated companies, they won't sign the deal if it's not on their paper. So right. it's usually getting their paper, often their DPA, which is even worse, and then starting to, starting to negotiate it. Um, so the, the, way I, the way we have it currently is that um, the three um, lawyers on our team, they do um, contracts, mostly it's contracts related, whether it's vendors or, or customers. Um, I do contracts as well, not as much as I did um, until our last hire, but um, I do that as well. Um, and then I said, I'll do everything else. So anything that's labor, corporate, um, equity, um, whatever, finance stuff, financings, you know, everything else, um, I, I take on my own. Um, yeah. Now we're looking to hire someone for who's more labor focused because we have already over 400 employees, and you yeah. know that comes. Um, there's more HR related work to do, um, so we're looking to grow more. But our our first hires were all transactional related. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which which makes a ton of sense, and that's where we are too at Link Squares right now. The vast majority of the work is contract based, and maybe some of that is like part of being b2b versus b2c and right. stuff like that too draft, uh, draft, i would imagine a lot of regulatory as well which you know yeah. we don't have as much so yeah yeah exactly yeah a lot of regulatory stuff and licensing and um yeah it was, it was definitely definitely heavy on that side um yeah. but you, you touched on this and i want to make sure we get to it i you and the team had a monster $250 million Series C that you announced recently. Um, can, can you just talk a little bit about that? I think it, it'd, be, it'd be great to get some tips and advice from your end toward you know, working toward a successful fundraise. How are you preparing? How are you thinking about, um, you know, how are you thinking about your role and how that differs from when you were outside counsel working on these deals versus now what you're doing in-house? Um, and then, um, you know, any, just really any other insights that you can give about, uh, about things to be thinking about. Yeah. So, so I think what, um, I think the, the role is much different than, um, is outside counsel. Um, here, the negotiation on the transaction docs was much, was more heavily focused on the term sheet part. Um, but once the term sheet signed 
and assuming you trust your outside counsel, which in my case, I definitely do. It's my friends who I worked with until right. I joined. Then there really wasn't much need for any involvement on our side. Um, okay. any, for, for starters, it was like it's our it was our fourth round. So by then, by now, you know you have your NVCA documents. Yep. Um, you, you run it. I mean, it it changed a little bit from round to round. But by the time you ate, you're in your fourth round. It's already been like heavily negotiated and and pretty much set. So other than changing numbers and letters and maybe a special provision, um, our stance is that you know. We're not changing our documents. Whatever was agreed on previously, it was agreed. So there isn't much work there. Where yeah. there was a where there was a lot of work, and I think that's where, um, even though it's like not the attractive work, but it's where your benefit, where your added value is in in house is, is everything that has to do with the diligence and like the company's existing documents. Because while the, I think especially when a company you know everything is going well, then the transaction documents. They stay pretty much the same. They don't change much because of the growth. Your data room has changed a lot. Your, yeah. your files, your folders, your history. Yeah. Um, and that's why, I mean, I think, and one of my recommendations is, is that like when, when first, when someone joins a legal, like he's the first legal hire in a company, uh, whether it's GC or not, um, I think the most important thing is to like get your documents organized. Uh, yeah. First of all, understand everything that happened in the company until you join, right? So whether what con contracts were signed, what policies exist, uh, are there any compliance frameworks that are being monitored by the company, all HR related stuff that happened. So really understand the history of the company, but then also start organizing the documents um, in, a, in a clear way. Now, you know, I'm obviously biased with link squares. I think that an organization can like do it in many ways, as long as it's a, it's a coherent process. Um, but there is no doubt like for me that a platform like link squares really makes this exercise much more easier. And it also acts as a force multiplier for the future because now not only that you have everything organized, but you also um, have can easily search for things have all the reporting, the dashboards, like the added value that Link Squares gives you. So when a, um, so when a, um, an investor asks you for, show me all the deals that are um, valued at at least X, or show me all the deals that you have this provision or that provision, the way we've done it until now is either go back, use an intern or you know someone who's like more junior read to look all. back at the documents and read the documents, yeah. or then that's that's if that's like in the good way. And the, the other way is just like, um, ah, I don't think we had the MFN. I don't think we had this. Like, a, and then yeah. you 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 have good guesstimates, but you know you don't. I don't know what to say, but you you know it's not bulletproof. Um, right. And and then you and then you just like give the answers that you remember. So, um, right. so I think that a tool like Link Squares just helps a lot. Um, and as a general rule, just organizing, having all the docs organized, I think that's where um, the big, biggest difference between in-house and outside counsel. When I was outside, I would give the due diligence stuff to like the young um, yeah. lawyers <laughs> or interns, and now it's heavily on us. But honestly, it's really important. Like you want your stuff yeah. together. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. You're, you're right. When you, when you get to, you know, when you get to a series C, series, series D and beyond, um, you know, looking at, looking at those docs, they are heavily negotiated. And one thing, uh, to the extent that you could disclose, what was the split between new money and pro rata from your existing? Uh, I'm not sure that I follow you. you our no. last round was, was all existing investor. It was, oh, it was all existing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they wanted uh, they wanted to uh, um, to double down. So um, that's awesome. Yeah. So in, in that case, there was really no almost no negotiation yeah. on contracts. It's the yeah. same people. Um, but but even but even in the previous rounds, whenever we, we had new investors, um, they kind of you know we we have like our first round was like Sequoia there, and then yeah. we had like Index and Insight. So it's also investors with like lead investors with top firms representing them. So for a new investor to come and start, you know, 
playing on like language that they need this language. It doesn't really make sense because like you had the best lawyers in the world like already reviewing it and negotiating and agreeing on something. So there's no right. point to like, keep dwelling on like language. Yeah, exactly. And and you know, for for us with our our Series C, um, you know, we we had a, a relatively you know relatively meaningful pro rata participate participation. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, for we we raised a hundred million, right? And um, and when you have meaningful participation from existing investors, that's like like they're part of the negotiation as well. Like they're not go, like because that rights just get reallocated. They're not right. really created or destroyed. And right. so what was a Series B right becomes a Series C right. But then you know all of a sudden the Series B lead investor is saying, well. I actually came in with a bunch of money in the Series C round too, so I still want to you know, like maintain that this right, that right. And so it definitely makes for an interesting, you know, an interesting um, way to sort of keep your documents from going too far from right. sort of like the NVCA base model. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, so I know we we've, we've just got a couple minutes left. Um, want to uh we did get a couple of questions here want to touch on at least uh at least one of them um and i think what's the best career advice you've gotten since moving in house um to well one of them was not to not worry about um asking for budgets and and not and, and explaining to you know to like the CEO or the exec team that bringing in-house lawyer is not you're not coming to save money right so like a lot of times the thought is like oh instead of paying firms like the billable hours which are obviously expensive i'll bring someone in-house and i'll reduce the the fees and that's true like the fees for like for what we pay for day to day are low but then you have all these like privacy considerations that we consult with privacy council um or you know export import control things that a company if they don't have someone in-house who's minded for it, they wouldn't even think about those kind of things. And all of a sudden they are thinking about it and they're paying for it. Also like legal tech, they're paying for it, but it's it's dollars well um, well paid for and are worthwhile. So like, I think legal teams and like lawyers like are always trying to like not be that cost center that costs a lot of money to the company. And, you know, I spoke to a few GCs and like, trying to be brave and like keep the team to a minimal like you have the sales team growing um exponentially but like you're trying to stay with two lawyers because you don't want to um the budget um to be high so i think like believe in what you in your cause and what you're doing and your value to the company and and don't be apologetic and ask for the same things that others are asking for that's right yeah that's that's a great perspective and you know i think that that should resonate well with with founders too is like if you're trying to bring somebody in because you are worried about a financial impact of spending too much money with external counsel you should really reevaluate why you're bringing somebody in and like if that if that's your goal is to just decrease costs um you know in the short term then just go and negotiate a bigger discount right Right. like firms firms will do it if you're as your volume increases they'll give you bigger discounts you know right. that, they do it all the time um yeah. so flip, yeah. side, flip side of that question and then we'll we'll wrap up here because we're at time is um what advice do you have for someone considering making the move from from a firm going in-house so for, for i mean my first one which is the issue that i had was don't be afraid to do it like there's this myth in firms that like it's all about it there's two problems one is like you're suffering because you're doing all these billables and working late night and and hating on your life oftentimes but then there's the prestige of like being in a big firm especially big corporate firms um and you think that when you're in-house it's like doing all the uh, gritty work and like not very attractive and and it's not like i don't know there's no prestige in it um people get for prestige so i would say like if you're not happy in a in a law firm 
you should definitely uh, make the move. Don't worry about titles, whether it's, I don't know, legal counsel, senior legal counsel, things like that. Um, yeah. Get it, your foot in the door and, and, um, and, and roll from there. That's awesome. Nir, thank you so much for, for taking the time with, with, uh, with this today. Really, really awesome insight. And, uh, and as always, a great conversation. And uh, definitely let me know when you're when you're flying back over here. I'd love to. I mean, even if you're in New York, I'll pop down. That's an easy easy flight for me to make. So um, awesome. I will. Look, and, and thank you very much. It was a pleasure as well. Awesome. Thanks, Nir. Appreciate it. Bye bye.